where do we start? The London Underground, where else? Now, this is the original map of the London Underground. Now, uh, it's probably because I've been probably been doing dissection a bit too long, but I think this looks like a reclining lady with a leg up in the air. You can see that? Can you see that? Or is it just me? Now, if we look at this, we can say, okay, this is actually really, this is at the time when this was done in sort of the 1800s or so. This is pretty, this is how the map sort of really looks. Now, of course, then there is the famous redrawing of it that became this. Now, the reclining lady is sort of less apparent. And this is where we have a similarity between this and this. Is that anyone, I presume all, you've all been on the London Underground at some point in your lives and have all probably used this map. And we know without a shadow of a doubt that this works. Functionally, it's absolutely fine, isn't it? You know? You know, with central line there, with, you know, you can get from embankment to Goode Street going on the northern line, no problem at all, and we know definitely, absolutely, that functionally this map works, just as this map over here works, because we know where the bicep is, look. This works, so therefore, that's a bicep. Absolutely, no problem at all. I have no argument with it whatsoever. However, it can be a little misleading. Now, as it happens, Imperial College uh, London is based at Charing Cross <coughs> Hospital. Any guesses on the map, as we're looking, where Charing Cross Hospital might be? Uh, th th that is the right answer. I probably wouldn't have asked it you had it been at Charing Cross. But whereabouts, roughly? I mean, you would say, OK, well, we're not expecting the station to be necessarily absolutely right. Any guesses whereabouts it is? Actually, I it's actually over there. Nowhere near Charing Cross Hospital, uh, nowhere near Charing Cross Station at all. It is completely misleading. And the same is true with the human body is that in some cases, and this is this, I can only speak from personal experience here when we're doing the dissection work, is that when you're at the legs, you can sort of go, yeah, okay, I can sort of see where Vassal is going with this. Yes, you can sort of see the muscle tissues in a particular way if you wanted to go down that way. Once you sort of pass the sacrum, then it all becomes a little bit of a lie. And once you get up to about the shoulder, this is a huge, great fib. You just may as well throw away the book. It's because there just simply is not deltoid, pectoralis major, trapezius, all these other things, they ain't there. They are not separated in some bizarre way. And in fact, one of the um, dissections that uh, they did at Imperial College uh, last year is that they did a dissection where they actually were able to remove, in a single unit, the whole jacket, almost like um, an American footballer's uh, type uh, pads. The whole unit was removed as a single unit. Now, when we're talking about continuities and how you work in body work, you need to sort of dump this idea that somehow deltoid is separate from pec, that's separate from trapezius, that's separated from um, latissimus dorsi, all these other things. It, it, it really isn't there. It's a confection. It's because somebody in the 1500s got a scalpel and said, OK, I'm going to cut here and here, and I'm going to call this bicep. Now, yes, functionally, it works. Functionally, it works. Not a problem at all. If you're a surgeon, great, fantastic, super smashing, marvellous. As a body worker, this is almost irrelevant and at the very least misleading. It is not helping you. What I would say is come back to doggy balloon, single unit. However, we can't really dump the whole thing because you've been using it for a while and if it's been around for 400 years, it can't be entirely wrong. It's not wrong. Just as much as this isn't wrong, but if you're a repairman, would you actually use the London tube map to do some repair work on it? The answer is no, you wouldn't. As a tourist going round, fine, super smashing marvellous. As a repairman, mm, I think you could run into a few problems if you started to use this map to start working on it. That make sense? So we need to take a new look at anatomy. Hence the name of the course, obviously. So we come back to Susan Hillman's three-dimensional design. Pretty much the same as every other design we've had so far. Nothing really changing. Now, I'm going to be referring to various aspects of muscles here. 
what we'll see is we've got pretty evident we have latissimus dorsi at the back, we have gluteus maximus into the iliotibial bands, and we can quite clearly see both the, the hamstrings and the calves, and also we've got trapezius running through. Yes, we're happy with that, and we're fairly clear. Or we, we're all happy with those terminologies for the time being, yeah? Now, we compare that, as we've already done before, just recapping over that in we have the skeleton in 1543 by Andrea Vasali versus the um, one done by in three-dimensional um, uh, CAD design uh, by Susan Hillman. Nothing's really changed. Yeah, we're good with that. Again, I would say you've got a far better idea of how the body functions in Vasali's than actually in the three-dimensional diagram. The, the, the posture gives you a far better idea of how the, how the body's functioning, I think. Well, this, uh, why, why this? I'm not quite sure. We look at the musculature in here. We compare Vasali's with uh, Susan Hillman's. There's a couple of changes, really. Um, but in principle, it's in essence the same. Spectacular work. You really have to hand it off to, uh, to uh, Andrea Vasali. Amazing stuff. Now, have you spotted the two deliberate d um, mistakes so far? I thought the Skellington's one was actually quite funny, but nobody liked that. Okay, so... How do we view the body? Now, traditionally, we view the body like a lighthouse, is that everything's stacked on one on top of each other. In other words, you've got the brick at the bottom is going to be taking more weight than the brick at the top, with hopefully a light going on the top. Yeah? However, this is a little bit incorrect, because if you ever lent that way, any of your discs would just pop out instantly if there was actually really all that loading in the base of the spine. Now, yes, S5, S1 discs are the ones that quite often herniate, now, one could argue is that because the, the system is actually failing and therefore the body becomes a loaded structure. A new point of view is the body is more like a suspension bridge. It relies on tension to actually support itself, hence why it's able to bend and move around without all the discs slipping out willy-nilly. Um, the, the very fact of a disc herniating is actually quite amazing to me, is that when you do do dissections, this idea in my head, I have to say, it's maybe only me, but to me, discs to me were like little nice little neat discs that were somehow gelatinous and a bit wobbly. Uh, whereas when you look at actually in real terms, they are solid lumps of gristle that ain't going anywhere. And for them to herniate, you would have had to have some serious pressure, not just simple weighting, but actual loaded where the muscles are actually doing the work. In the same way as breaking a leg demands tensional weight, you would need the same sort of thing to crush a herni to, to crush a disc. That disc is not going anywhere. Again, my point of view, but my idea of the, the discs being these nice sloppy gelatinous things moving around the place was readjusted signif significantly, is that for them to be crushed, you need an awful lot of pressure and sustained pressure at that to crush one of those. You know, they're there to be built for you to survive 70 years, running, jumping, bouncing, doing sports, all the rest of it. They ain't going to go easily. So the question would be, is the body more akin to this kind of structure, what's called the tensegrity structure? <coughs> is it supported, and this is by a chap called Ken Snelson, as, uh, an architect and sculptor, sculptorist that build these things. And it's a, one of the best examples I've come across in a structured building that looks like a spine, where the whole thing is none of these um, the hard structures, the bones, if you like, are touching each other and they are completely supported in tension through the tensional wire and able to support <laughs> up like that. Uh, but the tension is even across the board. Yes, there is some weight differential between the bottom and the top, but the tension is distributed throughout the whole system. <coughs> so the question is, is it more like, say, a, a car suspension in the sense that you have a spring or a hydraulic system and while that's working, it's fine. If it fails, you have a big rubber buffer at the, at the end that just stops you knackering the arch of your wheel, but it's the last place to go. To me, from my point of view, this is more akin to how I think the body functions in the sense that those discs are there, they are spacers, because obviously they're keeping your, your nerves nice and healthy, and they need to be industrial, and they need to keep things nice and healthy, because if they're not, what happens, you'll end up crushing the nerve, and then you're in some serious pain. So, normally speaking, one would hope that there isn't actually really any major pressure on those spacers, 
but when the tensional structure starts to fail, then it's basically your last port of call, as those discs are the ones doing all the job, and then you'd end up getting things like herniated discs, prolapses, that kind of thing. Make sense so far? Hmm? So we're going to look at the st uh, tensional structures. This is a tensional structure, the tensegrity structures they're called as. Now, again, they are, there's no connection at all. They are just held together with elastic bands. To me, this is one of the best examples, along with our balloon dog, of the human body, of how it functions. <coughs> Imagine, if you will, that these three bars, these three beams, are the three main beams in your body. In other words, TMJ, your shoulders, and your pelvis as they are interacting with each other, and I'll explain more what I mean by that and hopefully convince you that this is actually quite a nifty little piece of kit. And if we're really lucky and you're really dexterous because you did really well with the, um, with the balloons, you might even get to make a tensional structure later on. Okay? But I don't want anybody flicking their eyes out with elastic bands, so it's really up to you guys. Okay? So, three beams. Right. Now, actually, if we, if we take open TMJ, or your, your basically your mandibular joint, jaw, and open it this way, it is actually as long as the distance between your shoulders and also your pelvis, roughly speaking. Okay. So we, I'm just using this as an illustration here, is that that's your jaw, shoulders, pelvis. All right? For the time being, we'll take it a little bit further. Now, if we join the dots up in tensional terms, as in what we're doing, this is obviously a two-dimensional diagram, it's just a three-dimensional diagram of the same thing, rather than following an anatomical diagram like this, we're just joining the dots. We're going in crosswise motion from here to here and back again over to here. We have sort of a, a rough tensional diagram. Okay, with me so far? If we extrapolate that a little bit further, so we add in, say, the elbow and the wrist, knee and the ankle, we have something that, to a certain degree, go with me on this, a certain degree resembles the human form. But we're not doing any cutting here, we're just building it up from the ground up, just going crosswise in what we're referring to as a spiral line. It forms some interesting structures so far I think yeah so we need to look at the anatomical continuity as a whole now we've already looked at the balloon we all we all get that in terms of that the balloon started off you know it, it, we can define it by all these names but it started life off as a single balloon and as body workers we need to look at that and and take stock of that when we're treating someone so we come back to this, now we can already start to see where, okay, let's follow this tensional line idea. Okay. Now this is part of Tom Myers' work here, is if we strip it down, he, this is called the um, superficial back line, according to Tom Myers. Now rather than him taking it apart bit by bit, or even layer by layer, he takes it apart in sections of layers, in a weird kind of way. In this particular case, He's saying that there is a connection in terms of a single unit of um, muscle that is in essence going from latissimus dorsi and it becomes um, uh, uh, gluteus maximus and then fastus lateralis. Yeah, we're all happy with that. So you might argue it's also part of the luteal band, but in essence from his point of view you have this section it breaks down that, oh, that's latissimus dorsi, oh, that's that. In this particular case, according to Tom Myers, he's calling this view superficial backline. And he also adds in this crosswise motion. Is the tension, which we also found in dissection wise, is true. It's actually the tension, the way the muscles do, they do cross over at sacrum and they go in an opposite direction. So you have this tensional line running from the knee to the shoulder which is a body worker you can then start to look at it when, okay, I know cricketer is an example. Fast bowler. Why would you get issues in terms of opposite shoulders and knees? Is it because they're coming over this way and they're taking the knee around this way and you're also getting a fulcrum at the centre? 
where you're actually only getting a, a spinal injury in the middle. Does that make sense? If we take another section of Tom Meyer's work, what's called the... Um, no. Th this is the superficial back line. What I just showed you before was the spiral line. Superficial back line. Now, I want you all to stand up, please. Okay. Have I blocked your view there, Alex? <laughs> okay, so... What we're looking at here is, according to um, Tom Myers, he's saying you've actually got a continuity of tension running from hallux, big toe, all the way through plantar, back through the Achilles, calves, hamstrings, then through the fascia of the sacrum and running up the erector spina muscles up into occipital, and actually he takes it way over the aponeurosis and into roughly the, uh, the um, frontalis. Yeah, we're happy with that? Now, I have to say, I, I'm not entirely convinced by the going over the skull thing, but there's no reason why not, because there is a, th a fairly thin um, uh, band of fascia that runs across that. However, to demonstrate where your eyeballs are connected to your feet in a very real sense, because it's all very nice talking about it, but how does it apply to body work? Oh, and then this takes a little bit of doing. I just want you to get your two fingers and place them just under the occipital space, sort of see roughly, roughly here, just under occipital, occiput, Okay, very gentle pressure. We're not trying to push in there. We're using what's called eyeball pressure. And we're just trying to feel little movement. You can test this out by either side, nodding your head very slightly, left or right side, so you're actually getting a little... You, can, you should be able to feel the very slight movement of the tendons. You don't, don't say. Now, keeping your head still, all I want you to do is I want you to move your eyes left and right, but concentrate on whether you can feel the tension. Again, it's important you keep your head still at this point. You should be able to feel a small mo movement, almost like a pulse, on your fingers. Yeah. If it's not quite right, then just to move it either slightly further up or down into the valley of occipital. And you should be able to feel a very slight movement one way or the other as you move your eyes left and right. But just make sure you keep your head still. Yeah. We're happy with that so far? Okay. Now, so you can stop wiggling your eyes left and right. Keep your hands there. Keep your hands in the same place. Now, what I want you to do, if you've got the space, is just practice going on your tiptoes and back up. Don't, don't worry too much about what you can feel because there's too much movement at the moment, okay? So go back down to your feet. Now, what I want you now to do is I want you to engage your muscles like you're going to go on tiptoe, but don't actually move. And what you should feel is that same pulse in the same place on your fingers. So what you're doing is you're actually pretensing the uh, base of your calves to go up on your knees, but you're not actually moving. And you should feel a tensional movement just underneath your fingers. And it takes a little bit of practice, but again, it's a very gentle pressure, not trying to push too hard. Are we all sort of there, yeah? Don't worry too much about it. Most people get it, but it, again, it does take a little bit of fiddling. Okay, so we've now just proved that there is a connection, hopefully if you, yeah, whatever that connection is, doesn't matter, so you can sit down now, between your eyes and your feet, <coughs> yeah? So we're looking at, tensional-wise, we go, OK, well this, is quite, this is quite interesting. You know, would it, could we apply this and say, someone like a chef who has stood on their feet all day? If you think about that, if you've got a tensional line running through all the way through up to here, could it be why a lot of um, chefs suffer from migraines a lot? Is it simply because of the heat, or is it because, quite literally, that arch is starting to drop throughout the day, it's increasing the tension on the plantar, increasing Achilles tension, and so therefore, quite literally, you're just going to be increasing the tension running here, and then they start to get eyeball-type migraines. Everybody ever experienced uh, ch clients as chefs or chefs as clients? Okay. Or migraines generally, people who are stood up a lot. Yeah. So an application of how you would use this kind of information in body work, okay, well then there's a way of treating things, is okay, there's so many times where people will come to you with either a migraine or whiplash and the therapist spends half their life treating the neck and the head. Well, that's all very nice and maybe for some of the time that works. Great, because you fixed them. But what about those people who've had a migraine or whiplash for a decade? Well, obviously whatever we're doing isn't working. So I would question, maybe head down a different route. Rather than looking at where it hurts, follow the line of tension. In this case, maybe try out Tom Myers' superficial back line. Make sense? Yeah? In my experience, whiplash is more often the coccyx injury than it is a neck injury. Because if you really think about it, 
even the term whiplash gives you a clue. Because you've got a 15, 20 pound bowling ball here. And depending on the type of um, injury, again, this is, I can only speak from personal experience here. So therefore I would say, uh, and having had whiplash as well, I can speak from personal experience. When it tends to be a side impact, it would appear that physiotherapy and chiropractic work really well for whiplash. And I'll go see them because the nature of the injury tends to be more in, up and around the neck. Where it's a front or rear end shunt, where the head's gone backwards and forwards, think about it. It's called whiplash. If, the, if your head is the head of the whip, whoosh, where does the whip actually go crack? Down the other end, because the shock wave is that going backwards and forwards at speed will travel down the spine. If that person's maybe a chance to break the car at the time with their right foot, you'll find there's actually a tensional disparity in the right leg. They won't necessarily be feeling any pain, but when you start to palpate that area, you'll find that ITB is off the chart in terms of pain. Again, in my experience. So again, when looking at things like this, where somebody's had an unresolved whiplash type problem, start to think about what's actually gone on here, what happened in the injury. I might be preaching to the converted here, but it is fascinating the number of people that I see that come to me with a you know, a decades-old whiplash injury, and the people that have been treating them have been continually treating their neck. Because, oh, well, whiplash, that's where the pain is, this is where the problem is. I would say, no, start to go in a different direction, because whatever's going on, because let's face it, we're all really well-trained people here, I'm assuming. We were all presumably really good at our jobs, whereas do we get led up the garden path by what necessarily the patient is saying, my pain is here. Well, if we follow what Professor Gary Davis is, says, where he says, you know, source of the pain ain't where the source of the problem is. Well, then we're, maybe we should stop getting obsessed with the pain and start to track back what actually happened to the body when it got injured. We, we can get distracted because obviously the client's like, oh, my shoulder hurts, my neck hurts. Why aren't you treating this bit? Because you're down there looking at superficial back line. But if he feels better afterwards, then hopefully that should be fine. Again, a different way of maybe looking at it. Again, Tom Mize is really, really good in terms of if you're used to using muscle names and all the rest of it, is that he's a great first um, halfway house because quite literally, you know, 30 years of doing this stuff, he, he, you know, often called fascia man. I mean, he was not saying he was the first. There was Zimmerman in the 60s that was doing fascia work. But Tom Mize, great guy. He's really interested in doing this type of thing. He's starting to sort of pull away from it now, but... This kind of thing to get into actually starting to break down those terminological barriers where you're actually just thinking in muscle function and actually looking at following um, tensional lines. Tom Myers definitely worth a look in. There's a great book called Anatomy Trains. There's also a piece of great piece of software uh, by Primal Pictures called um, Anatomy Trains um, 3D Anatomy, I think it's called. Makes sense so far. So again, he's looking at tensional lines running right through here all the way up through past occip occipital. Okay. So we're now coming up to um, uh, some dissectional stuff. Now what I would say is that uh, for those of you who haven't seen dissection uh, work before, you need to get your head into a proper space. And as much as I'm happy to be funny at any other point in time, uh, well I'd like to take this relatively seriously because the people that have donated their forms for this uh, should be thanked and so should their families. Um, I'm particularly thankful to Gil Headley for allowing us to show this because at the time he did this, this had never been seen before. This is a comparative study on one side and what we'll be seeing will be showing the lower half of a, a male cadaver. On the right hand <coughs> side we'll have traditional dissection work where you'll be able to see sartorius, vastus, lateralis, all the individual muscle groups that have traditionally done in this kind of dissection work. It'll be very clear. On the other side we look at how he's taken the body apart just layer by layer and we're seeing the, um, the quads quite literally as a single unit because that's how the body is built. It is not divided. And he does a, a, a nice um, explanation of what we're looking at. So what I'll do is I'll first show just a still picture of what you're seeing just so you can get used to it. Um, those people who don't wish to see this, please, you know, either, you know, look away, close your eyes, because it's it got to be taken seriously. Seeing, you know, a cadaver is actually quite heavy duty for some people. Okay? So if we're happy with that, I might be labouring the point, but those people who have done dissection, and when they 
those ones that know what I'm talking about when you first do it, it is actually quite a big deal. Okay, and I would say that take it also that over the next couple of days, do not be surprised if th there are going to be a set of thought streams that are going through your head in terms of reminding you of this, because it, it, it can affect you in a variety of different ways that can be surprising for some people. Okay? So as you can see, lower half of the male, we have on his right side, we have traditional dissection work. On the left side, we have a layered dissection work. There's quite a significant amount of difference. On this side, we have what is iliotibial band. Now, iliotibial band is often imagined as somehow this single thin piece of, uh, or rather thick piece of fascia. It's a bit like saying the seam on my trousers is somehow separate from the trouser. Uh, iliotibial band really doesn't exist in, it, it's just a thickening of the fascia that goes around. It goes all the way around the leg. And again, when you're working on an iliotibial band, do you think you're not affecting the front? It, it is a single sheet of fascia that goes right around. More akin, if anything, because it does get quite thin on the inside, to that picture I showed you of Berengario de Carpi, is that skirt. Okay, it's certainly more akin to being around like this in his original uh, type of uh, work than the one that's done in here, which is this rather thin piece of thing that's somehow separate from everything else. Okay? Any questions so far on this? We all happy with this? Yeah? In a real sense, the muscles are things that are easily differentiated. The mental concepts of the muscles are things that are easily differentiated. Uh, and that enables us, us to say, oh, look, here's a really long one, or, oh, here's a, you know, here's a big one on the inside. And that gives us the names of the muscles, although it does not represent uh, functional units because anatomical conceptions of musculature are very different than the functional units, which are the motor units. When we see the atlases, when we see the drawings of the artists, they're tending not to draw in the little yellow lines. They're cleaning the tissue up quite perfectly, so you would never have known that there really was a solid relationship of these tissues. It's only by working our hands into the tissue and dividing these relationships so we can begin to differentiate. There can be a tremendous amount of bulk to the muscle layer. There can be a tremendous amount of bulk to the superficial fascia layer, whereas the skin and the deep fascia are never bulky. They can be extremely fibrous. They can be tough. They can be leathery. They can be strong, but they're never bulky. Okay. It's interesting to me. It's interesting. Um, I've done a lot of work with uh, the very well-known names in the physio world: Lynn Fletcher, Lindsay Meadows, Bobath Tutors. People are on a different planet from us, and um, you know, you'd be working with them, and, uh, and they'd say, "Feel, feel how this. This is like vastus medialis, but it's it's right around the back. You know, it's almost." Working like a hamstring, and uh, and they were they were probably still trying to work from yeah. this model. But you get trapped in your own terminology by saying oh, the limitation is X. Yeah. So, but this isn't where it is or what it's doing. It doesn't yeah. appear to be anything relating to the chart. So uh, when everything's working perfectly, of course it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to you don't have to mess about with people or put your hands on people. Mm. Were fine. Well, most of us haven't done since college. My little clutch of physio, traditional physios down in this corner, and we spent years playing with models, didn't we? You know, in our first three years, and and the, there were those were probably mostly symptom-free. But then, when you're trying to deal with people who have got problems, it's I don't know. The the, the map to me, the map has always been a bit wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would also say is that. Again, my experience in dissections, I've yet to actually dissect a body that is Mr. Average. You know, extra muscles where you shouldn't have them. And this is also the thing to remember is we're all individuals and we all adapt to whatever we're doing. And there's one particular 
uh, cadaver I can think of that had an extra set of muscles running through where, you know, you've got uh, spinous capitis and semispinous and the vetus scapula. And we're going, okay, so what's that muscle there? We, we ended up trapping ourselves in terms of naming the muscles. And we're going, well, that's that one, that's that one. That, you know, we're counting them out, and then we've got a couple of extra ones. And we're going, well, what are they then? I thought, well, obviously, for whatever reason, this person's obviously either, uh, if I remember rightly, I think they'd had a stroke, or you could tell that they had a stroke because one side was not, and so their body had built to support the head extra muscle fibres to support the extra weight of their head. Again, this is also really important to remember is that the, the body will adapt. And so getting too bogged down is this does this and this must be exactly there. It's like, to be quite honest, I've never seen this guy before. Even in traditional dissection, it's not there because they're all in slightly different places depending on what their living wa was like, what they did for a living. Um, now, uh, July last year, uh, one of the interesting things we did was look at hamstring. Now, traditionally hamstring sort of starts eh, sort of roughly up in here and down to roughly around sort of the anterior of the tibia, doesn't it, yeah, in traditional terms, yeah? Now, what we're looking at is, okay, that's the muscle of uh, or what we would classify as a muscle. But we have to remember that muscle is just the semolina that's stuffing in the ligament. You know, you've got a ligament and you think that's a piece of rope. It's not. It's got lots of little tiny strands, and then when it fills itself up like a sausage, then it gets bigger and becomes a muscle, and then the two ends are the two ends of the, you know. Yeah, look, I've just created a ligament because that's a ligament. Well, it's still part of the balloon, it's just this one's filled with air. The body's the same. Is it quite literally, it's the fibres that are filled, that are fi the, the muscle. I mean, it really is like semolina. If you were able to take every little tiny piece of fascia away, the muscle itself has no integral strength at all. It's like semolina. You'd have to spend an awful lot of time doing it. But it's basically, it's layers within layers within layers within layers of fascia, all filled up. So we're looking at, okay, well, if we actually stop throwing away this fascia, where is actually hamstring really? Where could we actually say it goes from? And what we found is actually, there really isn't an insertion at tibia, and, there really, and it doesn't sort of stop here. It actually goes well into the sacrum. It's actually part of the, the fascia of sacrum and continues down to the lateral malleolus in the ankle. Now, this makes complete sense if we think about the types of injuries you'd see in a cyclist. Is that if you think about where a cyclist is set, why on earth would they? Get, uh, why on earth would you so often get hamstring pulls? Is well, the hamstring never actually gets overextended at any point when you're cycling, does it? And yet, it's a very common injury. And yet, if you think about the fascial connection where it's lo locking into the ankle, well, you think about how much work the ankle does, then it suddenly starts to become a lot more apparent of why you get a hamstring pull because you're actually pretensing all the way through in uh, gastrox and the fascial insertion is actually at lateral malleolus. It makes a lot more sense and also would make a lot more sense of how you would treat that. Again, does that make sense? So again, each time we're doing dissection, we're discovering more and more of what's going on by not throwing away the fascia. It is li quite literally rewriting the book in how the body is physically built. And in some cases, you're actually overturning what was previ previously thought to be the case is that by following the fascial lines, by continuing through, you find they're not just short lumps all bolted together, it actually does continue on. And even then, by doing so, anywhere you put the scalpel, you are actually still separating and creating your own system. This is just one point of view, and I would say this is, what I'm saying is bound to be 50% wrong. Is because each each time, what was it Mahatma Gandhi said uh, when he was approached by uh, one of his chaps' w answer to a question, he said, well, yesterday you said a completely different thing, Bhopal. And he says, well, yes, because I was better informed today. It's a d it is an ever-continuing um, discovery. And this is the important thing, is that for 400 years we haven't really been questioning this map. Now, in the last sort of decade, we are actually questioning it, and we're suddenly finding an awful lot more information, which then leads us to understand how the body functions better. And in terms of from uh, the Chinese um, uh, medicine, like say acupuncture and shiatsu, it is opening a whole series of doors of being able to explain it in a Western point of view so that Western medics can actually understand what they're talking about. Because up to this point, it was, may as well have been in Greek. Well, it was in Chinese, but you know. Okay. Now, according to Schleip, on the observancy of when he was doing his fascial work, he found that actually central nervous system does not operate in muscles at all. 
which is suddenly everybody goes, what? Well, I go, well, what anyway? A muscle is never activated as a whole by central nervous system, and it's never activated as a whole at all. Is the central nervous system is actually activating fascia, which then contracts and then stimulates those muscle fibres to then work almost like a set of dominoes, or I think he uh, used the um, analogy of a school of fish, is that the first muscle cell gets triggered and then all the rest copy as it goes along. Now this makes a huge difference in terms of how we perceive of how the body works. Is that we've always been talking about muscles. Is that, well, do we actually mean that? Maybe we're splitting hairs. And in terms of our ability to move, there may be only nanoseconds difference, but fascia, it would appear, is the thing that is, is gives us the ability to move and change direction so quickly. Is that the reason this was found in the first place is he was remarking where the brain quite literally says, I want to sit up or stand up. And the body was actually reacting faster than it should really be able to, given the density of muscle tissue. Whereas it would appear that the electrical signal from the brain travelling down to fascia, because it's nice and flat and smooth and tight, then that is the thing that is being triggered. And that is why it's almost like a spider sense that, it by, you know, I don't know whether it's the speed of light, but brain says, OK, stand up. And we're able to stand up quite so quickly and change direction. If it was relying on just muscle to do that, it's too slow and dense. You think about someone who's very muscly, they're not terribly quick, are they? Whereas someone who's quite sinewy, uh, you know, Bruce Lee, you know, quite sinewy, he's a fascial built person, is incredibly speedy. Yeah? So before we go on the next coffee break, I'm going to hand you out some of these. So what we're going to be making here, and I would say, yes, we're using elastic bands. Please don't flick each other's eyes out, and if you don't feel safe with them, don't do it. Hate and safety announcement. <laughs> okay. So what you should have is you've got three lollipop sticks with three elastic bands, okay? Now, while we're doing this, I would say that if you just t take stock of what you're looking at, is if we, there should all be three different colours, and if we imagine this is... Your jaw, this is your shoulder, and this is your pelvis. Okay, so we already looked at the two-dimensional diagram. And as you're building it, think about this. When we're putting them together, the body is working together as a, as a single unit. It's a tensegrity structure. So what we first do is you take the first, your first lollipop stick, and just put over one elastic band. Yes. <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> okay, I didn't think it was that bad. You didn't have to hit me, you know. <laughs> There's always one. It was at the back with the balloons. Now it's at the front with you, like you see. So, <laughs> so now <laughs> take the second lollipop stick and place it just underneath, like that. So in essence, you should be able to support it with the elastic band like that. So you have a cross. And then place the other elastic band over it. So you join that up to there and around there. So you should have a nice cross supported with elastic bands like that. Yeah. Are you all there? So now this is the tricky bit. What you need to do is you need to, in essence, place the this nod, nodge in there. A nodge? Is that a real word? And hold on to it. So you've got the end of it. So you've got a, you're holding on to the two elastic bands on one end. Is it on the first yeah. Yeah, you're just holding on to it, yes. And then all you do is you pull... And so it's attached like that. So you should have a bit of a mess at the moment, like that. So where's the third I'll show you once you've got to this stage. And then you shape it so you've got a three-dimensional thing like that. So you should be holding it like that, roughly. Don't worry if it's not... Yeah. Okay, let me do that one again. Okay. Okay, you start off with a cross. Yeah, like that. Yeah. This, so you've got the... 
I'm putting this nod into the, uh, where it crosses, and I'm just holding onto that point so it doesn't disappear. And then I'm grabbing onto the other end of the cross, the, the where the, or rather the other cr where the two elastic bands cross over, and I'm bringing it across. And so I've I've got this shape at the moment. I'm just I'm just it's just holding itself together. Yes, well done. Yes, keep it. That's good. Yeah, don't worry if it's not the right shape. And then what you end up, then you just just do that. So you end up having a three-dimensional structure like that. And then what you do is you then join up the missing holes. So now you just have one over there, like that. Well, you, you should have the, all the all the joints to be jumped to be joined together, but they're not, are they? I shall come round and uh, help you. Okay, so as much as this was uh, possibly <laughs> a little bit of time taken there, but the reason we're trying to get you to make it is to understand if you think about someone who's coming to you with a tensional disparity, in other words, they're wonky, yeah? So therefore, if they've got a problem here, then as you can see, it's distorting the whole structure. Your body's functioning the same way, remember. Jaw, shoulders, pelvis. You have a tensional disparity somewhere. This is where the possibly the pain's happening, or maybe not. This is where the problem is, and it's distorting the whole structure. To realign that, just one simple tweak is unlikely to get it so it stays there properly. You'd have to do a little bit of fiddling here, here, across the whole system to get it so it's fine. Because if you make too much of an adjustment too quickly, you'll end up distorting the structure and it becomes a problem, yeah? But when it's well, it should actually be able to keep its shape when it's bouncing around. If it takes a sudden shock, no, that's pretty good. Now you can get it flat. Okay, this is, ah, oh, there you are. It's changed, can you see? It's distorted, normally I can actually get it completely flat. But to get that straight again, I'd have to make adjustments in several places, not just in the bits that appear to be wrong, but as I go around, it will just follow around. And your body functions in the same way. And what I'd say is, if you're going to go on a coffee break now, just take sort of 10 minutes or so, but I want you to take that with you and just have a play around with it. Is it understanding the nature of this? Is this, again, this is one of the best examples I know of. And there are, there are people out there that build these 10 secretary structures out of you know, 30, 40, 50, 66. In fact, there's a guy out there that's actually built a 10 secretary structure to look like a man. It's quite fascinating. It's on YouTube, I think. Uh, the guy's got too much time on his hands. Um, <laughs> because it, because the, thing it, the thing with a 10 secretary structure is that its weak point is it does rely on even tension throughout the whole system. It relies on each other. You start taking one part of the tension away, the whole system will collapse. I remove one of those elastic bands like this, and the whole thing just dissolves into something that's not useful, yeah? For me to reset it again, I'd have to play around. So we're going to take a short coffee break, play around with this, and just engage with this, this, and this. They are connected, and tensionally-wise, they are interdependent of each other. If you've got a problem over here, it, uh, it, it's uh, an anatomical impossibility, as far as I remember, is that if your jaw is not set right, in other words, you have an occlusion, as they say, in dental terms, or you grind your teeth or they're clicking, you're going to have a lower back problem. And the question is, it's a bit chicken and egg, is it that the jaw is upsetting the back or is it the back that's upset the jaw? When you go and see a dentist, before they start playing around with setting your jaw right, maybe you should get some type of manipulation technique done or some bodywork done to make sure you're straight to start with. Because if they start adjusting your jaw setting, that is going to be affecting the rest of your posture. There's some interesting stuff by a chap called Brendan Stack. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this stuff. He did some work with some Olympic athletes. And... Um, uh, they were they were sort of the post 70s uh, group of sort of the Russians and the English where they'd obviously been fairly heavy use uh, where they started off fairly young and there's a lot of steroidal use and quite a lot of them had Parkinson's type um, issues um, motor control issues and just by the adjustment of TMJ in his case he's an orthopedic uh, dentist uh, so, um, yes orthopedic dentist 
um, by using implants within the jaw, you could quite palpably see where motor control was gained almost instantly just by the setting correctly of TMJ. So when we're next looking at, say, a back problem, are we again looking too much at where the pain is? Or maybe we should be looking at other problems. Is there someone with a history of ear infections? Is there an old whiplash injury, etc., etc.? Again, it's a bit chicken and egg because you never know which is which. It doesn't really matter. But it's getting you out of the habit of just looking where the pain is and starting to look elsewhere, tracking further out. Now, I, I gave this lecture at um, one of the colleges a while back. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the teachers said, um, oh, we do work holistically. And I said, well, yes, so, so if you were treating the ankle, what would we do? Oh, I'll definitely look at the knee and the hip. Well, why'd you stop there? Why didn't you check the hand? Why would I? Sort of misses the point here, is that why are we stopping? You'd say, we're well, not working holistically, are you? You're working legally. You're working armally, you're working neckily. What is this? Is Look at this, this is the whole body. How can you possibly say with certainty that what you're working on, you need to stop somewhere? Who says so? Oh, I forgot, these guys say so because obviously muscle function, hamstring only goes from there to there. But again, think to Tom Myers, look at the anatomy trainers thing, look at this tracking through here, looking at tracking acrosswise. There are ways and means of doing it and after the break, we'll take it a little bit further and I'll start to give you an idea of where this, all this dissection work and everything else took me to, to hopefully give you an idea of a different map that you might want to use at some point. Again, it's only one way of doing it. It is not the way or anything. It is just a different way that where you're reaching an impasse with maybe a patient that maybe you think, well, okay, how about let's try this? Pull it out of what I call your jar of possibility. Rather than sticking to Bowen or Shiatsu or physiotherapy or chiropractic or whatever it may be, you can apply this way of thinking to any modality you like. Just work in a slightly different way. Don't restrict yourself with muscle groups or even anatomy train groups or whatever it may be. Just, just take a different avenue and go, just try something. Because ultimately, does the patient feel better, yes or no? If the answer is yes, then does it really matter whether you actually understand it or not? Try it out. I can think of one person not too far away that I think within 48 hours of this lecture, I think you had a... Is it 48 hours? with one of your clients with a head injury? Motion-wise. And yet you've been working with the guy for how long? Using some of these ideas very basically. Uh, and took a two and a half year established flexion contracture of the knee uh, some 18 degrees down to about four degrees mm. and straight. Yeah. It was just like, and it's not as if you're necessarily working differently in terms of your physiotherapy skill or anything else. It's just simply not limiting yourself to the type of terminology saying, okay, muscle X does this, therefore I must be treating here. You're just saying, okay, let's try this through, I'm assuming. You're just trying it out. It's not illegal to try it out.